not whether to spend the money, as that will be decided on during the next term of council and would only come out in 2028, but how the money would flow from taxpayers and the financial framework that that would entail. There have been discussions of a one-time tax levy or developer permit fees, but that discussion is being had today. A note that Ottawa has never contributed cash to a hospital project before, but it is a relatively common recent practice across the province. Chris Curry's City News. City News time 9.01. And now your forecast with weather specialist Denise Andriacci. Gorgeous weather today, mainly sunny this morning and afternoon. Our daytime highs in the upper 20s through Smiths Falls in Ottawa. Mainly sunny and hot for tomorrow. Highs near 30. We could climb to 31 degrees with mainly sunny conditions for Friday. So the stretch of beautiful weather continues here across Ottawa and Smiths Falls. Today's daytime high for the nation's capital, 27. And right now, 15 degrees in Ottawa, 16 degrees in Smiths Falls. City News Time 902. A demand for a high profile provincial cabinet minister to withdraw from the provincial election race in his riding. Report Stephen Lecce took part in a slave auction while in university. Here's City News reporter Kevin Meisner. The NDP is now demanding Stephen Lecce step down as the PC candidate for King Vaughan over these reports. Now, the outlet Press Progress is reporting the education minister took part in a fraternity hazing ritual known as a slave slave auction in 2006 while he was attending the University of Western Ontario. The NDP is also calling on progressive conservative leader Doug Ford to clearly and unequivocally condemn Lecce's actions. Now Lecce has issued a brief statement to the CBC saying he unreservedly apologizes and he calls the event from 2006 inappropriate. He says it in no way reflects who he is as a person. Lecce says he intends to continue to what he calls passionately advance the interests of Ontarians irrespective of faith, heritage, orientation, and race. At Queen's Park, Kevin Meisner, City News. City News Time 903, Loblaw, Canadian Tire, Metro, Kushtar, they've all donated goods and services worth about $400,000 now to an online portal the federal government is set to launch today. This is designed to let Canadian businesses donate to Ukrainian refugees who need help to set up here. About 80% of Canadians surveyed are in favour of a woman's right to an abortion. 70% of people surveyed by Leger and the Association for Canadian Studies are concerned about the leaked opinion suggesting the American Supreme Court is about to overturn Roe v. Wade. Pollster Christian Bork says while Canadians like to pay attention to American politics, he thinks the poll shows there is concern over the leakage of this document and what that could lead to. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Good, bad, or complicated. There's no news in Ottawa and the Valley he won't talk about. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning, Ottawa. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show. Rob is off for the rest of the week. Get excited, because Derek Fage is filling in. That's right. I'm Derek Fage. I'm that guy. Host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers TV. Pleasure to be with you. Lots happening. Oh, my goodness. Where to start? So many things happening. We have a great show for you. Great lineup, of course. It's Wednesday. We got your political fix. Lots to talk about there. We had the Northern Ontario leaders debate. Did you watch it? Did you did you check any of it out? Well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna ask you that in the talk back hour because as you know, each and every day at 10 o'clock we do the talk back hour. There's some announcements being made this morning. By the time we begin the talk back hour, we'll probably have some of those announcements. Uh, Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca is making a health care announcement at any moment. It was set for 9 a.m., so any moment he'll be making that. NDP leader Andrea Horvath is going to be announcing a plan to put money back in drivers' pockets. This is exciting. We go to the pump, we fill it up, we pay, and there's Andrea standing at the pump handing us our money back. It's it's exciting. I mean, I don't know how she's going to get around, but, you know, maybe she's got people. 
Maybe she's got people. I mean, she's a, she's desperate to win this time around. Do I think she's going to win? Absolutely not. However, this is, I mean, I think we'd all agree, those of you that follow politics and don't, that she's at her kick at the can here. I mean, if she doesn't win this one, I think it's time for some, some new leadership at the NDP. Uh, we have a brand new poll, by the way. Ottawa, Eastern Ontario, uh, Ontario Regional Breakdown. Brand new poll. We're just getting some numbers in. This is from Main Street Research, who is doing the polling for iPolitics. So this is for Ottawa, Eastern, and Northern Ontario. They're, they're looking at some, some current seat projections. So we're gonna sh- I'm going to share those with you in just a moment. But I want to go through the rest of the rest of the show here. As I said, we got our political fix coming up. We'll talk about those debates. Um, Stephen Lecce, as you just heard in our news, uh, in a little bit of hot water, of course. Um, a story about Stephen Lecce participating in a in a slave auction fraternity event when he was at, when when he was a university student. Get some reaction on that. What's this election about? Well, let's look at some of the issues from from last night. I mean, affordability, uh, 100% has emerged as by far the number one issue for voters during the early part of the campaign. I mean, we, we, we're all feeling it. The cost of, of living continues to rise across the province. Doug Ford talking about cost of living. He says, we don't need more taxes. We need more people paying taxes. I, I think he's got a point there. Right. If you watch last night, you, you notice that actually he, he frequently relied on notes. I don't know if you noticed that. He brought his notes on stage and frequently, you know, referenced his notes throughout. Uh, Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath reiterated her party's promises to raise the minimum wage when we're talking about affordability. Um, part of her platform is raising the minimum wage every year through to 2026 provide more provincial funding for dental care, prescription drugs, and mental health, things she says are going to help keep money in our pockets. And then meanwhile, Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca, he he talked about his commitment to have the province pay for more costs of of infrastructure construction and maintenance um, so that, you know, small towns, villages can invest more in services. For their residents. He also repeated that a liberal government would share. And, and keep in mind, you know, this is the sort of the northern Ontario debate. So if you're wondering where, where some of these ideas are coming from, keep that in mind. Um, he repeated that a liberal government would share 5% of revenue from the existing mining tax with northern municipalities. All right, so let's have a look at these numbers here. This is again from Main Street Research doing polling for iPolitics, uh, again, for Ottawa, Eastern, and Northern Ontario. Here are the current current seat projections. They have uh, the PCs at 18, so that's uh, 40%. That's a plus three seats from 2018. The Liberals sitting at seven seats, 26.8%. That's a plus three for them from 2018. And then the NDP falling, minus nine seats. In the latest polling numbers from that region, right? Ottawa, Eastern and Northern Ontario. One seat they're projected. One seat. Minus nine. Minus nine. Uh, Greens at zero, others at zero. And then um, as far as, you know, the other seats that are available, there's a toss-up of about about three. So the gist of all this, the Liberals are going to pick up some seats from the NDP. And the PCs are still holding the lead. That's three weeks to go in the campaign. And polling now, we're going to talk polling. I mean, polling, you're going to hear polling, polling, polling for the next three weeks. Polls, 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 polls. I should have started a, a polling firm. My goodness. Wish I, I wish I had started that many years ago. All right, what, what else is coming up now? We're going to take a break a bit early here. Because coming up, we're going to air an extended interview. I did this morning with Rideau Vanier Councillor Matthew Fleury, who shocked the city yesterday, certainly shocked me, 
when he made a big announcement because many of us, I think, were expecting, okay, you know, Matthew is uh, thinking about perhaps running for mayor. No, his big announcement was that he will not seek a fourth term on city council. You don't want to miss this interview. It's a fantastic one. That's coming up next on The Rob Snow Show. I'm Derek Fage filling in for Rob right here on City News. I think many of us thought to ourselves, oh, Matthew Fleury's making an announcement. He's going to say, I'm running for mayor. No. Matthew Fleury announcing that he is not running for re-election, either as a councillor or for mayor. And we have him on with us here on the Rob Snow Show, city councillor for Rideau Vanier. Matthew, welcome. Great to have you here. I Thanks mean, for having me on, Derek. Oh, it's a pleasure, and uh, you know that's you know you're in you're in my my riding, and uh, I'm yeah. I'm not going to lie, I, I was I was shocked. I did not expect that. Um, let's talk about the whys. Uh, why now? Well, it's uh, I, that after the last election. So I, I'm I'm 36. I'm at my you know I've com- now completed or I'm completing my third term. Uh, I, I came straight out of university and had this amazing privilege to represent Lower Town, Sandy Hill, and Vanier. 
and uh, it's been amazing, right, to have a chance as a, at such a young age to make uh, such a difference and be engaged in my community and and being you know central in, in in the arena on on the decision process. Some some we've done well, some I regret, and some we we really missed the mark. And you know, I I, uh, I really am proud of the city. I'm, I'm proud of where we're going. I think there's unique opportunities. And and for me, uh, after 12 years, I was clear with. Uh, key supporters and, and volunteers that it was either going to be the big race or I was going to do something else um, mm-hmm. for the time being. So a pause for now. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's hard because as you and I were chatting offline, it's a, a 24-7 job and I've yeah. done that for... The 12 years, and it's part of who I've become. It's part of my DNA. And now I, I you know, over the last five years, and maybe a bit, uh, a bit of a twist over the last two, I have a, a young, a young family. So yeah, I, I have to right. balance that. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as it used to be when we had so many events that the family could come out to and participate in. Uh, the last two years behind screen were, were quite difficult. Yeah, I know. I can. I can imagine. Um, you hinted in, in your video that 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 there may be something ahead for you in the near future. Um, you know, and you, you said you know you're not going far. Ottawa is your hometown. Determined to help shape, you know, the community in in many ways. Any hints you can give us of of what your next what your next plan is? I'm usually a pretty straight shooter, and I'll be I'll be it again. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, it was important for we me. We want to make an exclusive here, Matthew. Is what I'm asking. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Breaking news. Uh, it was important for me to make that the announcement at this time to allow for candidacies to come forward. Gotcha. Uh, okay. At both the mayoral level and um, and and the councillor level, I think you know when you're elected hold on and people look look up and say well if he runs I won't run and I think the best thing is for people to run next time there's a, a, a number of seats that will open we want ideas we want fresh ideas and for me um, you know I, I haven't spent an hour thinking about what my next step is right okay. I'm, I'm okay. elected until November 24th and during the more quieter summer days I'll, I'll start planning what my uh, what my next steps are don't worry about me I have a master's degree I'm, I'm a young energetic person Person who's you know I'd go back to a pool deck if I need to and if I have an amazing opportunity uh, to shape an organization or, or help the city in, in one way shape or form I, I'll do that um, I want to stay involved. I'm passionate about, as you know, I'm passionate about youth. I'm passionate yeah. about the Byron Market. I'm passionate about housing. So that it be an official capacity or in volunteer capacity, you know, I, I, I think you, you repeated what I said on the video, which to me is, is why I've done so well. I'm a hometown boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah. I'm passionate about my city. And I simply said a pause it, it wasn't to tease a future run it was simply to say at the age of 36 i don't know what's next i don't know if one day i'll have the opportunity to come back into politics and i don't think it was it would have been fair for me to open the door or close the door one way or the other so that's why and, and where i'm at right now it's a pause uh, and um, you know uh, hopefully hopefully one day i get this privilege again it's interesting you know we were musing uh, and my colleagues and i here at, at city news just you know my goodness like you know, when when you ran at, at the age of 24, we all said, "Man, it, it looked like the guy was 17, and now he looks 24." <laughs> and you know, you had that 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 incredible energy. You mentioned, you know, housing, uh, Ottawa Community Housing. It's an organization that you know uh, has had more than its fair share of challenges and and certainly criticisms. As, as you depart as chair of OCH, how, how do you feel about the state of of community housing here in Ottawa? On French media earlier, and uh, they asked me, you know, what's your legacy? And I, 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 locally, it's, you know, there's a number of things from the Ottawa Art Gallery, the Ottawa Bridge, some of the improvements to parks, no question. There's a lot of things I'd love to have advanced more. Housing and affordable housing and, and the shelter conversation mm-hmm. really needed to evolve more than it did. Uh, there's a bunch of things like that that I, I look back and we have to do much better as a, a capital city and, and people have expectations that we're not meeting. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's an important legacy for me at this point in time to say, look, 
Ottawa Community Housing is Ottawa's largest landlord. We have a housing crisis. We have 14,000 people on a wait list, which is a broader, all, all government levels responsibility. But locally, we're doing our fair share with OCH being in a position to build 1,000 new units a year. It's already in that in that space and, and okay. will be for over the next 10 years. So that to me, you know, thinking about most most uh, builders wouldn't be in a position to build 10,000, uh, 1,000 new units a, a year. We're, we're in that position and you know that's because of a lot of hard work that's because of a lot of good governance at the board so you know i'm not leaving a legacy with a with a, a sign i'm leaving a legacy of you know of, of good governance and of positioning the organization uh well respected and uh, able to uh, to deliver on what ottawa needs what do you think the legacy of, of this entire term of, of council will be? It's been, um, shall we say, uh, up and down, Matthew. Uh, when you yeah. look, when you look back as a group, what do you think this this legacy of this term of council will will look like in the future? Well, it's certainly a, a COVID legacy. Mm. Uh, I think this council would have done better in person. Um, I, you know, it certainly wasn't easy, uh, as you, as we all know. But I do think that there are some elements that this council can turn to, and over time, uh, will mark this era, which is LRT, like it or not. The first phase is now working. Uh, the second phase is well under construction. That, to me, you know, as a council, is something that we needed to invest in we needed to do and and needs day-to-day attention and and people of ottawa should not be ashamed if the if the transit is not meeting their expectation they should speak up they're paying a lot of money for it and it needs to be uh it needs to really be ingrained in ottawa's dna and and so far it's it's a bit on the periphery but i think over time the lrt will live well for this term um i think there's a number of of things when when you at, uh, bridges investments and you know we're back at lands now and there's conversation we this council approved um the public realm for the byward market so there's a number of things i mean obviously i'm when in what i'm describing i'm very biased to uh to to my area but right, i do right. think that um you know Sometimes councils, it's not about being sexy and, and, and spending money. It's also about improving our own internal processes and expectation. I think there's on, on a number of fronts we've done that. But there remains uh, some, some real emerging big city issues that we have not tackled properly. What about unfinished business, Matthew? I mean, for let's just talk about your riding specifically. You know, when, yeah. as, as, you, as you look back and, and, you know, with an understanding of your, your stepping away, what, what would you say is you know at the top of that list of unfinished business well we have 2,000 people every night that sleep in uh, in our shelters and motels of which 300 families are in motels right. I don't go sleeping well at night think mm. this council who spends 34 million a year on these on these very emergency services can't build more housing it that that is you know I I I own that by being the geographic area where the shelters are located and by being uh, by having a lot of these motels. I don't own that as a, a city issue. Uh, I, I've tried to advocate, but because only a few neighborhoods are faced with that, it, it's not sexy for a rural councillor or some suburban councillor to really jump in on these issues and, and, and re- realize the potential that we have with the public dollar that we're, inv- we're spending on, on these solutions that, uh, that really aren't until we ex- actually create a key to a unit with a, with a home. And, yeah. and, and, Derek, and, and you know, we've seen it spreading, right, Matthew? I mean, look at Hintonburg. You have residents in Hintonburg that are now, you know, saying that the, the, the difficulties, you know, that they see that so many people on the streets and, and the mental health issues and, you know, down Bank Street, I, I hear from from small businesses that say, you know, they've seen the population, the homeless population growing. It's not, I mean, um, certainly within your riding there, that's probably the, the most that, that you'd see in this in this city, but it's heart wrenching to see it now. Um, spreading to other parts of of our city as well. Yeah, well, it's a good example. Um, so before the, the before the pandemic, people will would really look into and hone in on my area and say, well, you know, Flurry, do do something. And the amount of things that I've raised and motions that I've moved to council to 
to change the dial to transform and then the pandemic hits and you can't have proximity uh, and shelters are like six people per room so you can't you can't make it work so all these respite centers are created including the one at Tom Brown Arena and you know months later years later the community is starting to speak up and saying whoa these we're seeing now what the Byron market's like and why it's not we're feeling the same types of pressures ultimately there's sort of two main drivers one is until someone can stabilize and have their own place their own to a unit with a lease. There's very little you can do. They're in chaotic state. And then many of the folks that are on the streets today suffer from addictions. And yeah. anywhere they consume, they are stigmatized and we're not providing the adequate health response to their addictions. So, you know, safe supply uh, is a good example where, you know, it, no one wishes to inject every day, but if you're injecting 11 times a day, if you're doing so with a clean drug and, and you're you're in your own home and uh, you're supported uh, with with medical uh, experts, you know, really helping you to get off, to wean off and to stabilize, there's opportunities. But we're not we're not serious about that. We still think that you know someone come. We have to go back to how shelters were created, right? Which was people, men came back from the Second World War and their families weren't around. Right. And they had different types of issues, and they a lot of them were heavy drinkers. And here we are, years later, with the same model, with very different realities and demographics. So, you know, I, I'm going nowhere. I'm going to have the, a lot of these conversations uh, over the next number of months and years. And obviously, I have ideas. I think we can do it better. And I think residents of Ottawa expect us to do better in, in the capital city. Matt, you what about advice to somebody that that decides? Uh, you know what, I, I want to run, you know, uh, Matthew's leaving and um, I, I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of this community, of this particular ward. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody that, that decides to throw their hat in the ring? Okay, well, <laughs> there's a lot there. Uh, <laughs> first off, ask yourself, are you the right person? Right. Are you the right person to represent not a, an issue, but the community generally? Do you understand the issues? Are you engaged in your community? Have you, do you have examples of speaking out on issues or getting engaged? A lot of folks have opinions, but do they, they, are they willing to work on them and, and, and bring communities together? Um, and then, um, you know, don't just do it. Like, I, I come from the sport world, as you know. Uh, when I do something, I do it with intentions and I do it to win. So, right. um, you know, fo I, I always, in my world, I, I, you know, people that just sign up and then do nothing, it's like, well, sign up and, and go door knock, go fundraise, go, go put up lawn sign, share ideas. If you're willing to do that, then yeah. And, 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 and when you're willing to do that, even if you lose, I've not heard from a good candidate that they regret the experience. So that's another, right. uh, another twist to the story. Matt, you really appreciate you taking the time. And um, from all of us, you know, here at, uh, at City News, thanks so much for your, for your service over the years. As you said, you always, you always brought uh, plenty of energy and, um, you know, regardless of pe whether people saw, you know, eye to eye with you and, and shared your opinion. I, I think you've done it um, exceptionally well and, and respectfully. Well, I appreciate that. And Derek, that's the best thing in our democracy is we don't have to agree all the time. But as long as we know that generally the people that represent us work hard for us and they have good intentions and they're clear about their, their expectation, that's all we can ask. And, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, it's, again, my hometown and, and I'm elected until November 14th. So I, I will, hopefully I'll be back on the show on, on other issues or opportunities along the way. Oh, I'm certain you will. Matthew, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, take care. Of course, that's Matthew Fleury. Um, the announcement that he is not running again for re-election, either as a city councillor or as mayor. Uh, this is Derek Fage filling in for Rob Snow. We'll be right back with more right after this.
FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, May 11th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 18 degrees, 19 in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news this hour. First out of the election promise gate this morning, the Liberals and leader Stephen Del Duca, who says his party will invest $1 billion to get surgical wait times down to the pre-pandemic level they were. By the end of this year, Del Duca says there are as many people waiting for procedures in Ontario as currently live in Ottawa, about one million. Evening and weekend procedures would be among his solutions. City Councillor Matthew Fleury will end that career in October, not uh, re-offering in the October vote. Fleury tells City News this morning having a young family made it more and more difficult to give the time needed to look after resident concerns in the Rideau-Vanier ward. He says the next step for him, he hasn't really thought about yet. As Election Day draws closer, though, and his time winds down in that role, he will start thinking about his own future. Perhaps a sign from the United States today as to the Canadian inflation rate being released in about a week. American inflation in April, 8.3 percent. That's a reduction from 8.5 in March. The month-to-month -month rate is the smallest uh, decrease in eight months and is a sign prices may be peaking. City News Time, 9.33. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Welcome back to the Rob Snow Show. Derek Fage here filling in for Rob today and for the rest of the week. Oh my goodness. So many things to talk about. Got latest polls all over the place. Uh, speaking of polls, we're going to be talking. Uh, about some of the latest polls with Abacus Data later on in the show. David Coletto will be joining us, the CEO of Abacus Data. He'll share some of the latest Ontario election polling. want to remind you as well, at, in the 10 o'clock hour, we have the talk back hour. We do it each and every day. Three weeks from tomorrow, it's voting day in Ontario. We want to know, have you made up your mind? Are you still on the fence? What issues are important to you? we got a lot of little questions we're going to be throwing out there. We'll share some... Some quotes from last night's Northern Ontario debate. A lot of different discussions on affordability and highways and pandemic response and housing. Lots of lots of issues. Well, speaking of all those issues, let's get let's get some some reaction perhaps from from last night because it is time for the political fix. Joining us is Ashton Arsenault, Vice President of Crestview Strategies. Welcome to the show, Ashton. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Carl Belanger, President of Traxian Strategies. Welcome to the show, Carl. Great to have you here as well. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Um, let's talk about Northern Ontario, the leaders' debate. Um, let's start with you, Ashton. Did you did you watch it? Did you catch any of it there last night? Uh, I did. Um, if I'm being honest, I thought it was a fairly muted debate. Mm. Um, wasn't particularly surprising to see uh, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. Horvath do what they can to gang up on the premier uh, during that debate, considering what polling is looking like. Um, but uh, as we saw yesterday, I think the premier is pretty good at dodging attacks. And, and frankly, I don't think any votes were swayed by the debate yesterday. We'll see if it gets a little bit more feisty in the next debate. I believe that is on the 16th. But... Bit of a nothing burger from where I sit. Okay, okay. Carl, how about yourself? 
Well, uh, it, was, it was quite the contrast with the conservative leadership debate we had last week. <laughs> you got that right, yeah. <laughs> That's putting uh, it mildly. So, so I, I don't know if I would use the word muted, but it, it was certainly more s- civil. Uh, and mm. so for that, I think there's more information for voters to gather. But, you know, it's the first uh, the first clash between the three. Um, uh, Orvat is the most experienced there. She uh, didn't seem to outshine her opponents. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ashton is right. Like, Ford is a premium. So, of course, the opposition will, will go after him. Right. Uh, they, the first task of an opposition party is to convince voters that we need to throw the bums out. Until they do that, neither Orvato del Duca will take over. So that's the first target. And right now, uh, Premier Ford is still at the top of the polls. So they need to uh, keep doing that. I, I think, like, you know, really most elections in, in recent memory, this is a very sort of leader-centric election. The polling numbers we do have right now show that when people are asked about which leader uh, or, or party they support, the PCs certainly have an advantage, but regional breakdowns are a bit murkier, uh, murkier um, Ashton. Does, does this dynamic work to, to anyone's advantage, do you think? Well, all it says is that the premier is firmly in the driver's seat. Um, mm. I think it's going to take uh, a catastrophic failure or some unknown victory that I can't seem to put a finger on right now to change the course of how this election is going to go. Um, the PCs are firmly in majority territory, um, you know, plus or minus a few seats on where they currently stand. Regional breakdowns are important, there's no question. And look, uh, if I'm being honest, um, there are a number of toss-up seats still. Right. Uh, is that right. is that enough to knock off majority numbers for the PCs? I don't know. I don't see it right now. But again, you know, there's, we're three weeks out. Something could happen that changes the course of this election. But right now, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, Carl. There, I mean, a lot of a lot of promises. Uh, affordability certainly emerged as as the number one issue, and I, I think you know people are just looking at the cost of living and you know the early part of the campaign is the cost of living continues to rise across the province doug ford is talking you know we don't need more taxes we need more you know pay you know people paying taxes andrea horvath is going down the you know let's raise minimum wage every year through 2020 everybody seems to be tackling it in a different way um from what i'm seeing is advantage Doug Ford for the most part when when you're talking taxes because he has he has promised to to freeze taxes and you know the the spending that we see with the liberal and and NDP parties um, I think I have some people concerned right at the end of the day sometimes we 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 vote selfishly what are your thoughts on 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 what you know each party is doing as far to, as far as affordability goes Carl yeah, well, what do you mean sometimes we vote selfishly? <laughs> <laughs> I think most of the time people vote for their own interest or what they believe is their interest. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, low taxes is something that is easy to campaign on. It's an efficient recipe. It's worked before for many people, and it may work again for, for Premier Ford. Uh, but there's no question that people live in the now. And, and you know, right. you, could, you could quibble with the pandemic management of the Ford government, but people are kind of moved on, right? And the cost of living is what everybody's talking about. So either you go by increasing revenue or you decrease what comes out of the pocket. So it's one or the other, and we'll see what voters decide. Yeah, Ashton, I, let, let's you know hear your opinion on that. I mean, as Carl said, yeah, of course, you know, um, perhaps exaggerated there that we vote selfish. I just mean, you know, sometimes we, I think as voters, we look at all the, the issues and, you know, sort of our moral compass comes into play as well. But then we get into that voters box and we go, well, wait a minute, um, who's going to make sure I can put food on the table and pay the rent and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I generally think pocketbook issues win the day um, mm. and the environment Frankly, if you're making an affordability argument, uh, there's not much of a better time to do so. I mean, we've got uh, rocket inflation. We've got interest rates that are going to go up seemingly every quarter from now until inflation is under control. People cannot afford a house. People are struggling to put oil or gas or heat their homes. People are struggling to put food on their table. Affordability is the issue that must win the day, and it's going to be the issue that wins this day in the province, which is why... Um, you know, if you're a supporter of the NDP and the Liberals, I don't think it's going to be your election. 
And Carl, uh, optics are important. You know, there's been a bit of mudslinging early on. What, what do you make of this business with PC MPPs taking, you know, these allowance top ups? I believe there's there's eight of them in all. Um, locally, the one grabbing headlines is is of course Lisa McLeod in Nepean. She got an extra forty four thousand in in perks from from the riding association. There, do, do you think voters care about this stuff, or you know, is it more of a way to motivate the NDP base to get out and vote and in, in in close ridings? Well, uh, it's funny because it should bother the PC base more uh, because it is money coming from public subsidies to Reading Association and from donation from the PC base that is going in the pockets of MPPs who we were told were in it for the people. They were not in it for the money. Right. Lo and behold, uh, they need more money to do their job. I don't know why. I don't understand why. I think our elected officials are paid fairly. Uh, you could argue that if they are undercompensated, Make that argument. Make a you know bring bring it a pay raise. Don't go through the back door with some scheme from the writing association. I don't think that's right. And uh, will it motivate the NDP base? Maybe, uh, but I think it should upset the conservative base. They should they should ask some questions here about why is it that public money and donation money is going to top up MPP salaries and in the case of McLeod, a minister salary. Yeah, Ashton, does this stick at all, though, right? Because, you know, in the, in the, in the news wheel, something else is going to come up in the next hour and the next day fairly quickly. Uh, the optics of this doesn't look good. Uh, certainly the Liberals and NDP, I would imagine, will, and, and the Green Party, for that matter, will, will try to jump on things like this. But, but does it really stick for that long? Well, I think Earl hit the nail on the head. Um, this is going to probably incense government voters more so than Liberal and NDP voters. But I will say this. An exceptional example of opposition research uh, and really was executed quite well. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think across the electorate voters are going to care about this too much at the end of the day. Um, I'm not really sure it motivates anybody to show up to the polls, more or less. But again, to Carl's point, I do think it makes for a challenging story from the government's perspective, and I suspect in a few riding associations, they will have some explanations to get out to members. On on that same vein, as, as far as optics goes, Carl, you know, we had this uh, report from the blog Press Progress uh, has a story about Stephen Lecce participating in a, in a slave auction fraternity event uh, when he was a university student. Obviously, um, you know, terrible look and, and should be condemned. Um, he's apologized for it. Is again, is at the end of it? Uh, does he need to do more? Does this this does this stick to the PC party? Well, um, he was not wearing blackface, was he? Uh, so I don't think it will stick. Yeah. Uh, if it yeah. didn't stick for Trudeau, which seemed to be way worse, and he's a much bigger personality, I don't think it will stick with Lecce. And he did the right thing by coming out and apologizing right away. Not defend it, not explain it, apologize, move on, right? So there's some people who try to keep uh, making some hay with it, but I think that at the end of the day, it happened years ago when he was much younger at university and frat stories and this and that and no crime was committed and uh, and he's accepted responsibility for his action so i think he'll, he'll get away with it yeah i i tend to agree with you ashton what about yourself what do you think yeah i'm of the similar vein uh yeah. sir yeah. a horrible name for an event and uh it is absolutely right to condemn it um i i, I was happy to see Mr. Lecce come out and apologize quickly for his participation. And, you know, I'll say this: I don't think his, uh, I don't think this particular event in any way reflects who Mr. Lecce is as a person. Um, I, I know him, um, and I've worked okay. around him in a okay. previous life, and he's honest. He's a decent human being, and uh, I expect him to move on from this. Uh, Andrea Horvath has an event at 10 a.m. today, and uh, the party says she's announcing a plan, Carl, to put money back in drivers' pockets. Did, any idea what what this could be about? Well, I might have an idea. <laughs> um, uh, I think they'll go with. I think they'll go with public auto insurance. Uh, okay. Okay. You know, Derek, that uh, because I live in Quebec, and not only because I'm a much better driver than you, but, <laughs> but I pay half of what you pay in insurance premium in Quebec. The average in Quebec is about 850. And in Ontario, it's over 1,600. Mm. Why is that? Yeah. Public versus private. And I think she, where she, that's where she's going. It's a good affordability issue. It's something that everybody can relate to and uh, can understand. Carl, I, I hosted Breakfast Television Montreal for four years. Um, I, I'm going to call you out on the driver's thing, okay, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> 
Ashton, Ashton, over to you on on this one. Um, you know, uh, when when Andrea Horvath says put money back in drivers' pockets, uh, Carl obviously thinks insurance. Some people think perhaps a uh, gas price regulation of some sort. Uh, what do you think? I'm loath to agree with Carl again, but I think he's absolutely right. Look, um, and I'm auto- bringing you two together today. This is wonderful. <laughs> uh, auto and uh, auto insurance race is something that um, uh, the NDP caucus has been harping on for years and years now, uh, particularly CTA area MPPs like Gerton Singh and a few others in and around the Brampton area. Uh, just because of how rates are established in Ontario. So I I, I do think it's an issue that resonates for them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was sort of the message of the day. And if I'm uh, on the other side of things, I don't think anybody believes that the NDP is capable of getting gas prices under check. So I don't buy that as the announcement today. Okay, okay. Uh, We're going to take a break. Uh, We're going to turn our attention to the CPC leadership. There's... uh, the English language all candidates debate tonight. It's happening in, in Edmonton. So we're going to get uh, the thoughts from both Ashton and Carl after this. This is Derek Fage filling in on the Rob Snow Show. And you're listening on City News and watching on Rogers TV. Riding requires attention and focus. No distractions. No moment of unawareness because one brief moment can cost a lifetime of other moments. Everyone deserves to arrive home. Maritime provinces are home to some of the oldest settlements in Canadian history. But did you know that one of the first was actually started by black settlers? Take a minute to learn about the rise and untimely fall of Africville. Black people have lived in Nova Scotia since before the founding of Halifax in 1749, but it wasn't until after the American Revolution in the late 1700s and early 1800s that large groups of black settlers began to arrive in the province, many of whom were former slaves promised freedom and land in Nova Scotia. What they encountered when they arrived, however, was racist treatment by their white neighbors and government officials. This pushed many black people to build homes on the outskirts of town instead. But despite the area receiving little support from government officials and lacking necessities like functioning sewage systems, access to clean water, and proper garbage disposals, the tight-knit community persevered. And so Africville was born. For more than 150 years, the small community grew, expanding from just a few homes to a population of over 400 people. Everything changed, however, in 1964, when plans for a new bridge and the idea of urban renewal prompted the municipality to set its sights on Africville's land. Instead of investing in the community, officials approved a relocation program that promised free job training and employment assistance to help residents through relocation. But the reality wasn't so kind. Residents had their belongings moved in city dump trucks and homes were demolished immediately after their owners left. Of the 400 plus people living in Africville, only 14 residents held clear legal titles to their land, so the rest were only given $500 with the promise of more social aid in the future. Not much else was actually done to support Africville and its residents until 2001, when a United Nations report called for reparations to be paid to the community. In 2010, Halifax Mayor Peter Kelly apologized for the atrocities against Africville as part of a $4.5 million compensation deal. In 2021, Councillor Lindell Smith put forward a seven-part motion to plan for the future of Africville alongside local organizations and the descendants of former residents. Today, there's a public park and museum where Africville once stood to teach visitors about the history of the land and its community. If you've never heard of Africville, you're not alone. The tragic story of this small black community in Nova Scotia is not as well known as it should be. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Welcome back to the Rob Snow Show. Derek Fage here filling in for Rob. Of course, uh, it's the political fix part deux. 
We are talking to Ashton Arsenault, Vice President of Crestview Strategies, and Carl Belanger, President of Traxion Strategies. And we turn our attention um, more to the to the federal side of politics because the CPC leadership uh, race is on. Uh, things have gotten pretty heated. I, I think that's an understatement. Um, there's only one English language all candidates debate tonight. It's happening in Edmonton. The last debate hosted here in Ottawa saw Pierre Poiliev on the attack with his patented fire rhetoric and he and Leslin Lewis even got into a bit of a fight over who supported the freedom convoy more and then in stark contrast of course we have Jean Charest who maintained that it was an illegal demonstration and no politician should be supporting it even after the fact um, this is like a battle for the soul of the party Carl um, and I, you know I think Many of us predict, predicted this. What, what do you make of what you've seen so far? It, it seems like a, a, a real divide within, uh, you know, um, opinions uh, w- within each of those leaders in this party. Yeah, to me, it feels like uh, the marriage that happened between the Progressive Conservatives and the Reform Alliance Party back in the days mm. uh, is failing. Uh, that's what I'm getting from it. Okay. They are two different types of conservatives, and they don't get along. And it resurfaces every time there's a leadership race, and this time it's worse than ever, probably because of everything that happened with the pandemic and the convoy truckers. And uh, there's a tone and a stridency in the attacks that are against their own team that I've never seen before. I mean, there's always been, you know, high elbows and, and, and cross checks when there was a leadership race because you're trying to win. But there's also an understanding that they're part of your team and you may need that to win voters over later. That's not the case anymore. Um, that's not what I'm seeing when I hear Paul Yev attacking Charlet and calling him and Brown a liberal and a Trudeau liberal and this and that. They're, they're ra- really trying to subtract people from that party and I don't understand the strategy behind it uh, unless there's somehow out there a huge swath of people who are so fed up with politicians that they, they're going to buy it. Right now I don't think right, but right. Maybe, he's, maybe he's got it onto something. Yeah, and Ashton, I look. I'll use that word selfish again. I think you know, looking at at, at the way that these uh, leaders, or, or I should say, potential leaders, are are battling out here, it's it, it seems like they're putting aside. Whether uh, I know there's a lot of rhetoric coming from Pierre Polyev and he's already running for prime minister in his mind, but it's kind of putting aside who has the best chance to to win the next federal election against Justin Trudeau and, and the liberals and just making sure they win, you know, the, the party leadership and, and they're going to be, you know, happy enough to do that. What, what do you make of the way this battle is playing out so far, Ashton? Yeah, well, you got to become the leader of the party before you can run as prime minister. Certainly. So, yeah. um, there, there, are, there are two things that I know to be true beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, leadership races are divisive by design. Uh, it's always going to be that way. Every single time there is a leadership race, particularly among the Conservative Party of Canada, we see news story after news story about, oh, does it have to be this divisive? Why is somebody going on the attack against X or Y? Mm-hmm. It happens every time. The party will survive. And number two, that I know to be true beyond a reasonable doubt, okay. winning takes care of everything. Hmm. So when this is <laughs> over, I believe that they will rally behind the new leader, which frankly is looking like it's going to be Pierre Polyev, and I think that's good news for the party. Really? They, eh? will have, okay. they will have a far better chance at unseating the current prime minister than they have in the last two elections. That's it. That's interesting because Carl, you know, from from some of the people that I've I've spoken to within my circle, uh, look at look at Pierre Poiliev coming in. Um, can he win against Justin Trudeau? Uh, perhaps, but it would be more of sort of a fatigue of the Liberal Party. Okay, you know, they've been in they've been in power long enough now. We want change just for the sake of change. However, if that leadership. Of, of Justin Trudeau, if he happened to step aside, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not very hopeful that, that he would, but if he if he were to step aside and someone like a Christian Freeland jumped in, um, would that make it more difficult for a progressive conservative party that seems to be stepping much further to the right than what we've seen, you know, from, from previous leaders? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it is stepping, up, uh, stepping uh, to the right, and I think the strategy... Uh, or the approach seems to be to win we need to gain votes and the easiest votes to get 
are those that left with Maxime Bernier and are with the People's Party. We need those back. And, uh, and the second thing we'll do when we get those back is make sure that less liberals show up to vote. And so we're going to try to, you know, depress that vote. Uh, so yes, Poiliev can win, and I think any of them can win. And Ashton is right that there's a much better chance of winning now than there was last time, and then there was the time before that. Of course, there's fatigue that's setting in, um, and, and, and we've seen in the past, changing leader is not a magic wand that just fix the fatigue. Uh, if voters are fatigued and are tired of a garment, they can, they can swing wildly and fast. Uh, are we there yet? I'm not sure. Uh, are people repelled by Poiliev? Well, certainly if you look at the uh, people that are red-blue, traditional red-blue switchers, I'm not sure they like what they're seeing. But maybe maybe that's, that's enough. Maybe they, they don't need to vote for the conservative. Maybe they just don't need to vote for the liberals. Ashton, what are your, what are your thoughts on what, what Carl just, just described? Yeah, I think he's right. And if I had to add a third truism in politics, it's that timing matters. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think you, you see the ascent of the current prime minister on the back of um, an electorate that was fatigued with the Conservative Party of Canada under the leadership of Stephen Harper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel that um, way for that, sure. That, that that is a wave that broke to Carl's point very quickly uh, and quite extreme. Um, you know, to go from third party to a majority essentially overnight uh, at the time was unprecedented. Right. So right. you know, I do think the conditions for that happening again um, are, I don't want to say more likely than not, but certainly a possibility. And, you know, whether or not uh, somebody like Pierre Polyev can attract uh, more moderate voters or, you know, to Carl's point, red-blue switchers uh, into the camp. Look, we've got a couple of years um, between now and the next federal election, assuming the deal between the Liberals and the NDP hold up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think a lot of things can happen. And, you know, I think... Pierre, somebody like Pierre's messaging around um, affordability and, you know, the ability to purchase a home and things like that will really resonate with people, particularly younger voters um, in more sort of suburban rural areas. And I think there right. is a viable voting coalition there to install somebody like that as prime minister. Well, and he has certainly he certainly got the machine going. I mean, uh, he is all over social media. Uh, I'll give him credit for that. He. He is working extremely, extremely hard, more, more, than, more than any other leader I can remember in, in, in my time since I've started following, you know, politics over the last uh, sort of 30 years. Gentlemen, I uh, really appreciate you spending time with us today. Thanks so much for joining us today on The Political Fix. Pleasure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, you're very welcome. That's Ashton Arsenault, uh, Vice President of Crestview Strategies, and Carl Belanger, President of Traxion Strategies. Hey, coming up next, we do it each and every day. It is the Talk Back Hour. We are opening up the phone lines to you. We want to hear from you. This program is brought to you by...